Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program tonight. My name is Victoria Petusek, and I'm the Phillips Collections Grants Manager. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's film discussion, but I'd also like to spend a, send a special thank you out to all of our members and donors at every level who are here tonight. Your support is critical to our success, especially as we continue to operate and offer free programs like this one during the pandemic. The film tonight is a documentary called Rosenwald, which follows the incredible story of Julius Rosenwald, the son of an immigrant peddler who never finished high school and who rose to become the president of Sears. Inspired by the Jewish ideals of charity and repairing the world and a deep concern over racial inequality in America, Julius Rosenwald used his wealth to become one of America's most effective philanthropists. This important documentary reveals Rosenwald as a silent partner in the pre-civil rights movement. To briefly introduce everyone you'll hear from tonight, we're joined by Aviva Kempner, the director of Rosenwald, an award-winning filmmaker who creates documentaries about underknown Jewish heroes and social justice. Curly R. Holton, a printmaker, painter, and the director of the David C. Driscoll Center at the University of Maryland. E. Ethelbert Miller, a literary activist, author, and the host of the WPFW radio show, On the Margin with E. Ethelbert Miller and the scholars on UDC TV, and our own Elsa Smith Gall, who's a senior curator here at the Phillips and a specialist in late 19th and early 20th century modern art, with a focus on topics that examine the cross cultural dialogue between American and European art. And on that note, over to you, Elsa. Thank you so much, Victoria. And I um, want to add a warm welcome to all of our virtual audience uh, and our panelists. Uh, we're just so delighted that we can, we can actually accommodate even more folks than we would have otherwise if we were in the, in, in the auditorium at the Phillips. So we're looking forward uh, to spending a wonderful evening with you in dialogue around Rosenwald. And uh, would like to uh, mention, as you saw in the wonderful photograph on the screen of David C. Driscoll, that this program is dedicated to his loving memory. And I know that many of you have no doubt seen that David played a very starring role in Rosenwald, sharing his firsthand knowledge of the period and its cultural luminaries. So um, it's, it's a wonderful uh, moment um, to pay tribute to someone so near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, David, as many of you know, uh, enjoyed regular visits to the Phillips Collection since he came to Washington, D.C. to go to Howard University in the 1950s, and he even met Duncan Phillips. Um, he also served as one of our dedicated trustees. I personally had the great fortune of interviewing David last February on the occasion of the Phillips' centennial. It proved to be, sadly, one of his last interviews. I really look forward to sharing the transcript of that interview with you all in the forthcoming publication that's due out in a matter of weeks to accompany our centennial exhibition, Seeing Differently, the Phillips Collects for a New Century. I would also like to take a moment and gratefully acknowledge the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and Aviva Kempner and the Siesla Foundation, whose warm collaboration and generosity have made this program possible. So let me turn it over for a moment to Aviva. She'd like to share a few words. Thank you so much, Elsa. I have to say it's not only was great interviewing you, but also developing a friendship. And the one thing I want to shout out about Elsa and the Phillips Collection is when you have, um, when you show Jacob Lauren's works, you give them credit. I won't mention another museum that give credit that Rosenwald was part of that. So I really appreciate that. I just want to say briefly, because the, the big reason we're here is because I was inspired by Julian Bond, the great civil rights activist, uh, and it was his 81st birthday last week, to uh, this topic. I heard him speak on Martha's Vineyard and just say that he has a new book out, The Time to Teach that his uh, widow put together. So I really recommend that because it's so much of from one generation to another. I also am so excited that Elsa was open to the fact, because we've already actually had this film at the museum, but I wanted to do something in David Driscoll's name. 
He gave such a wonderful interview and I was just looking at it this afternoon. And one thing he said that his first art exhibit actually was a local clay work was at a Rosenwald school. He grew up in North Carolina and he also said that his school was not a Rosenwald school and the Rosenwald school in his area was a fine brick one. And he was actually a little jealous that it wasn't his school. But of course, years later in his scholarship, he knew very much uh, about all the artisans and this uh, interview with him, I'm gonna be given over to the museum and people will be able to access it. So I'm happy to be able to do this, but I would be really remiss if I didn't mention one person tonight. And that's my mother. You can see her self portrait behind me. Helen Cheshla Kavinsky was the woman who, whenever she visited me here in Washington, she said, let's go to the Phillips. It was her fa favorite museum. And it's because of that, that you know, I was exposed to it and I realized now I saw the Lawrence migration works even before I knew I was going to make this film. And you know, Rosenwald is so much about philanthropy. There, what I really would like to do is, if you all bear with me, because those of us, you know, it takes a village to make a film. There are board members who are very supportive of my movie. And so I want to make sure to mention George Vandenberg and his late wife, Trish, Carol Brown Goldberg, and um, Micheline Kladsberg, who all supported the film. And, you know, among my closest friends are artists, and I think they're all on today. And, you know, I love that artists support artists. So just one more minute of mentioning Gloria Logan, Dahlia Lithvak, Annette Poland, Marilyn Marcus, and uh, Miriam Morsell Nathan. I think the word is, it takes a village to make a movie. Well, it also takes a lot of friends who are artists whose work I love too. And I think in the end, what Rosenwald was, tr was trying to do with the Rosenwald Fund, which I know da uh, David talked about in his long interview, is to give a support to young, gifted and black artisans. And as someone who's older, but I remember I got grants when I was younger and Ethelbert can talk about that too. These grants make all the difference in the world. So in the spirit of that, those who are listening, I hope you all you give also to young and old, but artists, we need those grants and don't, don't stop giving them. It makes all the difference in the world. Thank you, Aviva. Well, more on that will come. Um, but before we do launch into the conversation, I just wanted to give you guys a sense of our format for this evening. Uh, I will lead a moderated conversation among the panelists for about 40 minutes, and then we will open it up for questions and answers and comments. Um, I know the panelists join me in, in sincerely looking forward to your participation in the dialogue and your response, sharing your responses to the film. Uh, so we will um, definitely um, leave room for that. Um, please do post questions in the chat. Don't feel that you have to wait. You can post them at any time um, that they occur to you throughout the program. Um, and then um, we will, um, as I said, make sure that we'll open it up for dialogue um, a little bit later. Uh, and I also want to um, encourage you to stay with us. Um, We're gonna close out our program thanks to Ethelbert Miller. Uh, he will be reading one of his poems. Uh, so we look forward to our conversation with you all. Um, and I think really, uh, Aviva, I, I can see how hard it was to condense a film into an hour and a half because Rosenwald's philanthropy was, loomed quite large and took many different forms from the uh, over 5,000 schools for black children to the Michigan Boulevard Garden Apartment Complex for the African-American middle class to a support of artists, scholars, scientists through the Rosenwald Fund, lots and lots of activity and more. Um, so I thought we might open up um, our conversation looking back on Rosenwald's legacy and I would just ask if each one of the panelists would want to comment on what you might consider one of the lasting contributions of Rosenwald's legacy today. Uh, so whomever would like to chime in first. Well, I'll begin with um, a person that I'll be talking about later on, Langston Hughes. Um, 
Jewish Rosenwald died in 1932, January 1932. I have a, a I'm going to read an excerpt from a letter that Langston Hughes wrote in March of 1932 to Edward Embry, who at that time was the president of the Rosenwald Fund. And I think you'll get a sense of Rosenwald's legacy uh, as seen by Langston Hughes. And I think we should, we should um, really look at what he says in this letter. Uh, and Langston Hughes was a letter writer. So, you know, this, this is a long letter to Embry, but he says here near the end of the letter, there's little need to say how deeply we all feel the loss of Jewish Rosenwald, friend of America and of my people. Little children all over the South looked at his picture that week and were sad to know that he had gone. May my present tour, which his generosity helped to bring about, produce something worthy of his name. For I must always remember him with personal as well as racial gratitude. And those are the words of Langston. And, and when he says here, I feel the lost Julian wrote, friend of America and of my people. And then I think what we see in, Ju in uh, Aviva's film, that picture of him in, in some of the schools. And so here's Langston, you know, you know, a few months after Rosenwald has died saying, okay, this is what he's meant to so many people in America. Yeah, I wanna build on that a little bit. I, I, what comes close to me when I think about Rosenwald and also the image of David was this sense of conviction, this commitment to transforming lives and to creating opportunity, opportunity that they didn't have to create for anyone. Of course, Rosenwald is considered one of the major figures because of his vast wealth, but there were many others that uh, predated him during the Harlem Renaissance uh, that believed that patronage was critical because it gave the critical and important resources to an artist to practice. And most of those artists were very, in many ways, very uh, vulnerable. Economically, they talk about Jacob Lawrence tying the door of his studio with a string, he was so impoverished. But with David also, David was really clear on the role of patronage. Not only the patrons that transformed his life and mentors from Howard University to the Harmon Foundation to the Rosenwald uh, school, uh, impact on HBUs that he, he taught it later. But this ideal of conviction and generosity and innocence of spirit, the innocence uh, in the sense to connect to the practice of an artist, the pure innocence of an artist to create work that otherwise would not be possible to be made. These patrons transform not only these artists, but brought culture into our world that probably wouldn't have existed otherwise. Um, and, and if I can add to that, you know, there's a line I've been repeating a lot lately that the late great um, Congressman John Lewis said, see something, do something. And I think time and time again in the film, you see that. Now, of course, it's Booker T. Washington who brought him down, but it's when Julius Rosen read his book, the power of those slavery uh, you know, autobiographies are really shown. I mean, that started the whole thing going. But when he came down and then, of course, for his 50th birthday, he asked um, Booker T., what can I do? And he said, you know, build these schools. And I have to now mention that Booker T. himself said, you know, Rosenwald said, oh yeah, we'll just use these kid houses from Sears. And Booker T said, no, we want to build the schools here. And, you know, you see Barbara Bowman in the film talking about living in the Michigan Garden Apartments and how her grandfather was Robert Taylor. By the way, she's the mother of Valerie Jarrett, who was the domestic advisor uh, during the Obama administration. So here he, he thought, okay, I'll do these things. But when he stepped back, he understood that people in the communities, they're the ones that should be um, you know, doing the work and it empowered them. On the other hand, he's driving from home to Sears and he sees that all these people coming in for the great migration are really in crowded circumstances. So he decides to go build the Michigan Garden Apartments or when the Y people come to him and say, hey, you know, we need to have more housing for all these people that are coming north. He understood that. And he, 
I think that's the most important thing. And I think that's something that we should do in our lives that if you see something, oftentimes we can all do something. Now, you know, not all of us have $62 million to give away. And my joke is I have two more films I need money for. So if you can, uh, you can give me a call. But seriously, each one of us in us, we can do something that can make lives difference. And what was uh, one thing that David said in the testimony I read this afternoon, especially in Elizabeth Catlett's case, that the, the Rosenwald Fund allowed her to go, and at that time she was married to Charles White, to go to Me Mexico. And there it opened up a whole avenue. And also we know with Augusta Savage, who was first denied, it has to be one of the worst applying for a fellowship and reject, racist rejections I've ever heard about. It made all the difference that on a Rosenwald grant, she got to go to Paris. So um, opening up avenues to artists was, was just incredible. Now, check me if I'm not right, Curly, but my understanding is that Harmon, and you told the story the other day, maybe you want to repeat it now. Harmon could be a, foundation. I mean, there are certain foundations where we're too hands-on, where I think the Rosenwald Fund, the other beauty of it is that it allowed the artists, they say what they're going to do, and they didn't check up on them. And look at all these incredible results. And I remember reading, you know, in Fisk, you can read the testimonies of people uh, getting testimonies of what you're going to do. I read the one that, um, the people who did support letters for Woody Guthrie. And one of them said, I don't know what he's going to do, but he's a great singer. So give him the money. So, you know, this land is our land is now, wasn't it just played during the inauguration? And that has a lot to do with the Rosenwald Fund. What is also amazing about that is that the Rosenwald was encouraging not only creative practice, but research. You had artists that were actually producing research whether it was Jacob Lawrence or others studying the material, and then transforming that knowledge into paintings and sculptures or uh, novels. So this ideal that that African American practitioner was not just there as an entertainment, like did, what did happen in Harlem in many ways, and also along with the Harmon Foundation, the, the artist was a source of entertainment uh, and had to have this Negro mystique. Uh, operating, but I don't think Rosenwald required that. He was actually, in some ways, creating an opportunity for these artists to impact culture for a long term, not just creating cultural objects to be consumed by the marketplace, but to actually impact the canon, to help establish a canon. You know, Curly, Curly, you could probably extend that to two other people that we haven't mentioned, but who are outside the art, where it's definitely important in terms of, of, of culture, and that's Charles Drew and, and Ralph Bunch. Oh. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, look at, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Dr. Drew's own sister had died in the, in the, in the teens that inspired him to go to medical school. He, he was like working football games, being a referee. He could not finish his last year. And his daughter, um, Charlene Drew Jarvis, who served you know, the community on our, on our city council, always talks about that last year made all the difference in the world being funded by the Rosenwald Fund and discovering the way to, to reserve plasma made in blood made a big difference during World War I and the Red Cross since then. Sure, sure. Another aspect that, that comes forward is the difference in the type of patronage and the location of Rosenwald. For example, in Harlem, you had Elaine Locke, Du Bois, you had a, a whole group of black intellectuals that were driving the patronage system. And of course, whites that participated. Actually, Zora Neale Hurston used to describe a, a group of white female uh, patrons as Negrotarians. They would study the Negro. <laughs> Negrotarians, have you ever heard of anything like this? But anyway, they would gather, host parties, support the artists, uh, again, entertained by these artists. And I think the Rosenwald shifted a bit because he was a very practical man and wanted to see the application of this material. But there was a large group of patrons out there and uh, it depended on where you were located, whether you were in the Black Belt in Chicago, whether you were in Harlem, whether you're surrounded by intellectuals that were also patrons and the awards that were given out, the Spring Guard Award by the NAACP and other ways in which they were patronizing these artists. So I think it's very dynamic and it's 
it has a lot to do with geography and also the background of that patron. I'm glad you mentioned geography. Having grown up in the Midwest in Detroit, I was also so impressed how uh, the foundation itself stayed in Chicago, the Rosenwald Fund, under the direction of Emory, who himself was very interesting. Quite frankly, Rosenwald stole them away from the Rockefeller Foundation, but he had grown up, I believe it was with his grandfather in Fee, Indiana, which was a very purposeful community where blacks would live next to whites. And he would, they would have, you know, it, because it was the North, it didn't mean that there wasn't segregation, but they would have gatherings with black and white artists. And you probably know more about it than both of you, but there was a really a Chicago Renaissance going on at the same time Harlem. And I know Gordon Parks, you know, who had been a sleeping car porter. And by the way, I might mention, I think one of the bravest people in doing the film were those sleeping car porters who took the Chicago defenders, hid them away, took them south, gave them out. Boy, if they had been caught by the Klan, forget it. Yeah. And the, on the, you know, I have a DVD of Rosenwald with a four and a half hours of bonus features, and there's a longer whole one on um, Gordon Parks. And I have to tell you that he's sitting there working, you know, being a porter on a train, and he starts seeing Life magazine, and he starts thinking, I can do those photographs. And luckily, he, he wound up doing them. Although the first time he did it, apparently his camera fell in the water. But it didn't mean when he did it under the WPA, the Rosenwald grant paid for his WPA grant. Do you remember in the film, he comes and he's sent out to places, it's a segregated Washington. Sure. So, you know, that's another thing these artists faced. And I forgot who, but there's one of the people who got a Rosenwald grant who went south. Do you remember Ethel Bird, who had a horrible experience? He's a Northern artist, and it was really frightening for him. I mean, I don't know if that's what Langston faced too, with, Zor you know, going around with his grant. Well, yeah, it was a, well, it, it was an opening, a realization for, for, um, for Langston, but I think we also have to give credit to Mary McLeod Bethune, who was in the South, you know, and she was the one that was encouraging, you know, Langston to take his take his work. But there's one thing you know, we're talking about this um, the fun, and maybe even maybe you know the answer to this because I was looking at the letters that Langston used was writing. Right. Um, I came across the letter because we're talking about, okay, you get the fun, the money, but somebody has to write a letter of recommendation for you sometimes. So, so I, I found it interesting that Langston asked James Weldon Johnson to write a letter of recommendation, okay? And he writes this letter to James Weldon Johnson in August of 1931. By September of 1931, Langston got money. <laughs> so the turnaround was like a few weeks. You know, I wish the Guggenheim or the NEA worked like that. You right, know? Right. Or the <laughs> so, NEA, yeah. Right. But, but what happened is that that was very important. And um, I think what we're looking at is that we're talking about the South in the 1930s. And um, for people who were not from the South, um, it was fearful in terms of going. Because when you look at the Chicago Defender, people who got to Chicago who wanted to leave were often leaving violence. Okay, so that when we look at that great migration, it is a the bow weevil, there's people leaving the land for economic reasons, but it's also violence that drives black people from the South to the North. Sure. And I, I'd like to do a shout out because we're here in Washington and there's maybe some lawyers listening or thanks to the DC bar for flunking me, I became a filmmaker and not an immigration lawyer because I came here to go to law school. But what I found really interesting is, you know, you see these great visuals of kids going to schools. Do you know who I'm gonna shout out now? Charles Hamilton Houston, who was once the um, director of Howard Law School that is not far from here, although I'm not sure it was located then. He was the mentor of Thur Thurgood Marshall. And in developing, you know, the classic desegregation case, they went down with a camera, I believe, and I'm hoping one day to see a dramatic movie like that, with Thurgood as his assistant camera, they took footage. And you know, that's the kind of thing that Gordon was doing as a lot of photographers are doing, or the paintings. I mean, the migration series is magnificent. Elsa, yeah. can you talk a little bit about- Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, happened. you know, it was actually um, Jacob Lawrence's first trip south 
um, after he wed Gwendolyn Knight, after he completed the migration series. So he paints the migration series before he'd ever stepped foot in the South, although he was the son of migrants. Um, right. But he got two subsequent grants from the Rosenwald and the second grant uh, enabled him to take his first trip south, um, that first trip south, and to um, work on a project where he was trying to depict scenes of the south. Um, and I also was reviewing his commentary about what the grant meant to him. For someone who got a grant, uh, who was, you know, this young, undiscovered artist, essentially, $1,500, he talked about how it was phenomenal. He finally could get his own studio for the first time and a studio big enough in which to lay out all 60 panels. And, then, and, and he mentions how being able to be in a space like that allowed him to think differently. It really had a creative uh, impact in, in the way he thought in, in different way um, and approached his work. And so it meant all the world to him. But I thought it was really funny because his little, his studio we got was $8 a month. No. And um, he said that, you know, for the first time he had extra money. And he said that, you know, that he and Gwen, they didn't really believe in banks. So that when they'd have leftover money, they would figure out, you know, what am I gonna spend it on, you know, as opposed to putting it in the bank. Um, so just to give you all a sense of, you know, that that for him, you know, was, was, a real, was really significant. Um, and the support um, he got, as I said, even two subsequent times. And so some of these artists did get these renewed grants, I wanted to emphasize too, not just one, but, you know, in his case, three, three grants that really did mean the most to him. And, and then speaking of letters, because I did, I've reviewed Lawrence's application to the Rosenwald Fund and all the letters of reference. Um, and Locke was really instrumental, Elaine Locke, the philosopher um, from, from Howard. Um, and also Jay Lida um, from MoMA, a curator. And when Lawrence wrote to, to share the news that he got the Rosenwald grant, um, it was Jay Lida who said, this is gonna be a project that the Rosenwald Fund is going to be very proud of. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he knew that it was really um, something very special that was going to result. Um, and sure enough, you know, we know, we all know, you know how special it was, but um, thinking about you know, as, as you said, Curly, you know, so many things that resulted, the creative production, our engine in a way that we would may not have had the benefit of um, otherwise, you know, having the luxury um, of, of having the, given the time and resources. And I know Curly, as someone who founded the Experimental Printmaking Workshop to help support artists that you really appreciate um, and, and yourself help support um, those efforts. Um, I wonder, you know, um, in, there's also, you know, going back to what we were talking about, you know, the, the spectrum of kinds of, of, of support that was given um, and what it was like to go to the South. Did you want to share any other commentary, um, Ethelbert, about yeah, yeah, Langston? I did, yeah, I did want to know, um, which is interesting, you know, he received a letter um, you know, award, awarding $1,000. He got, and this is in 1931, September 1931. And it seems as if they gave it to him, they, they advanced $600 to him, which in which he got a car and his um, college roommate, um, Radcliffe Lucas, um, agreed to drive him around, as well as being his manager, okay? So because Lanks couldn't drive, not only did he find a driver, but he found somebody to keep track. That's very important. Um, and what I find interesting is that, you know, the money came in like installments. You know, uh, and so I'm just wondering that how that is, just as I said earlier, I saw the turnaround being very, very quick. And that could be very important because this was during the depression, mm -hmm. right? And so that was something that I would say. But the other thing too, um, which is good for scholars to look at in terms of letters, uh, in the collected selected works of, selected letters of Langston Hughes, there are over 11 letters in which he makes reference to the, the Rosenwald Fund. And in some of those letters, it's ideas of things he would like to do. So what you begin to see through the letters is things that, you know, he was thinking about, maybe never completed for whatever reason, but the letters provide a real sense in terms of like, if there was no Rosenwald Fund, I wouldn't even think about this, okay? Mm -hmm. In fact, when he did receive the $1,000 uh, in 1931, it was interesting in his letters, um, not that he just wanted to travel through the South, but that he was working on a play and he's working on a children's book. Okay, so sometimes when we talk about the money going to Langston, it's like the tour, but he was working on a play and he's working on a children's book. 
And then during the tour, he took the work of other um, writers. So it wasn't just like him selling his own books and stuff. And he also had like a little broadside that he could make uh, uh, money. And then he was negotiating <laughs> in terms of like, okay, you can't pay me this much, but you can pay me something, <laughs> you know? And I laugh because historically black colleges have not changed in how much they pay their artists. So when I looked at what Langston was getting paid in 1930, I said, well, I'm getting paid that now. <laughs> Listen, it's just, just, just not joking. black artists also. <laughs> Right. They also became very, very generous themselves, the recipients. They believed in patronage because they had received it and they knew it could be transformative. I've often thought about this motive as an artist and creating the workshop that I ran is that sometimes you create opportunity that you didn't have yourself, that was not available. So you create it for someone else. So it not only broadens your experience, but enriches your own work. So I think when you think about Rosenwald, probably. I don't know if he ever articulated this, but it probably enriched his life. It brought in his oh. conversations, it brought in his experiences. So it wasn't just what he brought to these uh, um, individuals that were receiving the fellowships, but it's also what was brought to Rosenball, what, in, what uh, enlarged his spirit, what enlarged his humanity. So I think this is very important. And we see this in David, the personification of this in David. Not only did David get uh, opportunity and, and support and patronage and mentorship, but David returned it. He told me the story when he was a student at Howard, James Porter came to him and pointed at him and says, you have a role to play. You have a special responsibility to advance our culture and to deliver that culture to the future. And David, this was large for David to be introduced to this kind of responsibility, but David took it. He told me they taught him how to dress how to pack, how to travel, how to prepare himself for this opportunity. And David did prepare himself and he was a very singular individual in that regard. But also David gave the same opportunity to others because he had received it. So he's okay. making the world larger because he witnessed that segregation uh, in Eatonton, Georgia. He saw the limitations the one room schoolhouse that he was in, it was all black. And he wanted to undo those limitations that caused him some uh, suffering and some consequence. He wanted to remove it for others. So I think it's important to look at that generosity that comes about at, from the recipients of the support and also the patrons, how they benefit from this beyond just providing opportunity. Um, Elsa, the, the one thing I think people should understand is sort of how Lawrence's migration series was split up. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, um, yes, because of course, that involves um, the Rosenwald daughter. Yes. Yes. So, um, so the, the Phillips collection owns the odd numbered panels of the migration series and MoMA uh, owns the even numbered panels. And, and many of you know this, perhaps, but um, the, the, you know, it's sort of still sometimes um, begs the question, you know, and why, you know, um, and how did this even transpire? And the fact is that the, the split purchase happens in 1942. So I do want to just sort of rewind the clock because it's very soon after um, Lawrence finished the series that thanks to Elaine Locke, he came to the attention of Edith Halpert, who was the gallerist for the downtown gallery. And so thanks to, to her interest in uh, putting forward African-American art in an exhibition, having read Locke's book and having seen that this was a, an important development that most people really had not been aware of, um, what was going on um, in the history of African-American art. And so she um, comes up with the idea to do this exhibition um, and it's a really sweeping exhibition, 19th century to, you know, to artists working up to the current artists working like Lawrence at the gallery and um, so she's really the one who, who woos Alfred Barr over and woos Duncan Phillips um, to, come, um, to come and see, see the work. In fact, Duncan Phillips was already in a relationship in, in terms of buying from Edith Halpert other artists work. Um, so um, she, she receives both of them. They both come and look at the exhibition. But in addition, she had had a committee put together um, that was part of her exhibition project. And Adele Rosenwald-Levy was on that 
Committee. And she was, of course, Julius Rosenwald's daughter. Um, so she um, is also um, you know, going to have seen this incredible series of Jacob Lawrence's migration. And she's on the board of MoMA. That's the other role she played. So in a sense, what Halpert did is she, she um, brokered the deal um, in which Adele Levy actually buys the half that then she immediately gives to MoMA and Duncan Phillips buys the other half. Um, they were never vying to buy the whole. I do wanna make this clear because it's a bit of a legend um, that they were both vying for the whole. Um, I think really Halpert um, came up with this idea that, that maybe she could put half in each institution. It was a very big series. And at the time, Lawrence really was not a well-known artist uh, at all. Um, and so he, I think she didn't expect either of them would, would spring for buying the whole thing. So um, it was her, her idea. She, um, she did run it by Jacob Lawrence. And although Lawrence originally did prefer, of course, like any artist, to keep it whole, um, he was later in an interview with um, my former colleague, our senior curator, Beth Turner, um, who, who really talked with him at length about what, what he felt about that. And he had no hard feelings, actually, about that split because he said how, I mean, how wonderful that I could be in two great collections. Um, you know how he was always so gracious and humble. Um, and um, we, had a, we enjoyed a very wonderful long relationship with Jacob Lawrence during his lifetime. Um, but it was Adele Levy who, owned, who ended up really acquiring through her generosity, the half that went to MoMA. And I will say the other fun little tidbit is that she had one particular panel she favored. And it was because of the one that she favored that was an even numbered panel that MoMA gets the even numbered and not the Phillips. Now, the other way it could have been split was one to 30 and 31 to 60. That was offered as another alternative. Um, and Duncan Phillips was given the option which way to go. Um, but anyway, that's a little bit of the, uh, the background that ties us also into Rosenwald's history. And um, since I'm a big, I make a lot of films during World War II, I have to say the opening of that exhibit was the day that would lay in infamy. It was the day that Pearl Harbor was bombed. So you can imagine there wasn't a lot of people showing up. And my understanding is it's a thousand for each collection. Right, the cost, the purchase price for each half, yes. And I'll, I have another JR uh, or Washington part of that. So Adele's, uh, is a great grandson, um, David Deutsch, who lives here, it's his wife, Stephanie Deutsch, who has written a book. Uh, they live in, and she lives in the district on the relationship between Booker T and Julius Rosenwald and another grandson, and that's Peter Askely in Chicago has written the book on Rosemont himself, both books that were very, very key and helpful to me. Um, and I think it's just fascinating that there was that split. And, and, and that's another thing about Rosenwald's kids. They were very committed to continuing in their father's footsteps, even though the foundation had stepped down. And another, um, Bill Rosenwald, was very involved, and this was after J.R. died in 32, in saving 300 members of their family from uh, Germany. You know, the Nazis had already taken over. So, and several, many of their grandchildren who, I mean, I would be here all night talking how many have supported the film and now we're hoping to pay off the rights and get a, a, a deal so that it can be streamed. Um, and it's just a wonderful example because, you know, his whole legacy of doing matching grants, which was so important in terms of the schools and even the whys. Um, and I, I don't know if that was so much with the artists themselves, but it's taught in philanthropy school and is even something that, that really works today. Well, actually, it was I, on that subject, I, I think that, may, that might be an interesting segue to thinking about the kind, what kinds of bold public and private um, sector support might help us today on a path to repairing the world, if I may borrow the idea that Rosenwald really was so inspired by in the Jewish doctrine. But, you know, we're, we are as a country so divided. We, you know, we're at a moment of huge reckoning around uh, systemic racism. 
and um, you know, amidst a, a, a big pandemic and that's revealing the, con the continued disparities, huge, deep disparities. So, I mean, I think it's interesting to think of the example of Rosenwald and his philanthropy, but really take it forward to today. What do you all think might be some ways that we can be you know, bold and innovative in thinking about um, philanthropy and what, we, what would really make a difference um, at this well, time? I think we have to realize that we're also seeing a paradigm shift. Um, so it's not just a pandemic, it's a real shift, you know, that, that is taking place. Uh, if you talk about foundations, uh, I was looking at, listening yesterday to uh, Melinda and, and Bill Gates, I think they get it, you know, in terms of one, any foundation is going to be out there, it's going to have to take risk. They're going to have to do that. Uh, and they're going to have to sort of reimagine things. So, you know, you're getting back to Langton Hughes, I dream a world. That's where we're at right now. We have to talk about how do we, you know, bring scientists and, and artists and, and, and creative people into the public realm. You can see just by looking around that politicians have failed. And I think politicians have failed because some politicians began as entertainers and actors, okay? So really right now with this paradigm shift, you know, we really need to make sure that we can imagine a new world, okay? The one thing that I give Trump credit for because Obama was not that interested in it and, and it has to be part of what we do now. He sort of revitalized our space program. Okay, and that is very important because as we talk about climate change, right, and, and trying to save this planet, we definitely don't want to go next door and mess up the next planet. Okay, so you really want to make sure that we have this thing, okay, we're not just concerned about the United States and red and blue states, but how we can first see about how the world is functioning. Okay, and this is why I'm glad we're back with the, joining the World Health Organization. Maybe we'll function in the UN. If we don't have a global vision, if our foundations have, have a global vision, it's not going to make it. Okay, that's why it's important to say, okay, Roosevelt funded artists and he funded scientists. Okay, and that's very important. You know, when we look at the fact that Drew would go on to get a, um, a, a Nobel Prize, I mean, I mean, Ralph Bunch would get a Nobel Prize. That's what we want to fund. We want to fund people who are dealing with our illnesses. We want to stop, uh, fund people that's dealing with peace in the world. And, and we have to make sure that we fund people who can speak for those who cannot speak, like the polar bears, okay? That's what we have to be thinking about. So if, you don't have, if, if you're in a room at a foundation and you're only thinking about black people and not the polar bears, I think you have more work to do. Yeah, you're talking about also uh, uh, legacy and institutional uh, uh, vitality. You have a lot of institutions that are committed to a mission that celebrates diversity, uh, culture and difference that are struggling, that are very financially fragile. So if there are ways to support those institutions so they could go forward and maintain that legacy so we inherit that in the future. I think that's gonna be really important too. One of the things that what happened to me with Black Lives Matter and the protests, we had calls from uh, leaders of institutions that I knew that wanted to let me know that uh, uh, that, that uh, they were apologetic, that they didn't, you know, they didn't mean to be so discriminatory. They didn't know they were so bad, and they wanted to talk to a friend or a colleague that was of color so they would have a space to apologize in. And I would say, you know, don't call me to apologize. <laughs> Just, you know, do something about it. Do something about it. And, and one of the things that disturbed me most is these institutions, and I'm not just talking about cultural institutions, but businesses would appropriate those symbols and language of that movement for corporate purposes with nothing behind it. You would see it everywhere. So what I'm, I'm suggesting is that not only has to, has to be this support of institutions for legacy, there has to be critical evaluation, critical analysis, critical assessment. Benny Andrews says in a film that I saw recently, Benny Andrews, the artist, said that one of the things they had to deal with, that there were no uh, critics of color, period, when he was, when they were protesting in front of the, the Metropolitan Museum in MoMA, no critics of color, no one to write about their work. And he said, even at this date, and that had to be in 2007 or so, there was still no critics of color. <laughs> You know, I tell you something that has not always struck me as I, in studying a number of African-American artists over time, you find out that there were only a few that were in those academies and those institutions. One African-American, uh, uh, Johnson, 
uh, William H. Johnson, one African-American in, in the Academy in New York, and Charles White, it just goes on and on in Howard Woodrow. When I went to the university, get my master's, and this is outside of a city, Cleveland, Ohio, the majority of the population was black. There was only one black student in that classroom, and that was me. Still to this day, it's like the 1920s in those schools. Um, I, I think, you know, I grew up in Detroit and I went to an all city school which with a big emphasis on the arts and Diana Ross and Lily Tomlin went too, they were above me. Um, and still not, um, more than 90% go on to college. And I think of that role model that made me what I am today. And I think it's so important that whole, you know, that the communities get involved in the schools and they build them. We should do this time and time again in all major American cities and in rural because it came out of that rural area. That's one thing. Second of all, um, I'm now working on a film on the insidious use of Native American mascotting. Ethel Brooks in that film too, called Imagining the Indian. And again, it's the Hollywood portrayals. It's our own community portrayals. We have to break those stereotypes that are taught time and time again. I mean, every day I'm watching these old Hollywood movies and it's just the same old game. And even we have Parasite where you have the young kid being, you know, having a teepee in Korea. And this is the Academy Award winning film. So we, we really have to break open just like the Rosenwald Fund did. And I just read with great joy what the Mellon Foundation just did. To go, I mean, I know what it is to go through those archives. Oftentimes, if, if you're doing films like I am that have to do with minorities, you can't even find any archives on it. And it's just great that, sh that they have de uh, designated that these archives be developed so that you know, we can figure out about everyone. And, and that, it, that in itself is so important. And I have to say, I think there's another issue that's sadly been brought up recently from a friend of mine, uh, Representative Jamie Raskin. And that's also, not only do we have to worry about the polar bears, I think we, this is something my sister-in-law, Lisa Van Suster does, is dealing with as a psychiatrist, that climate change and the effect on our youth and everyone, there's a lot of worry that people think we're not gonna be here for, for our kids or the kids don't think that we are. And we've got to deal with that kind of mental illness time and time again, and just like for Native American youth, it's a very high suicide. And a lot of it is because their portrayals, that, that there's no self image that, that they can identify with. And that's, that's not what America is about or should be about. You know, I like to mention, um, definitely on this program, the importance of Elizabeth Alexander. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to being head of the Mellon Foundation, she was at Ford. What I recall just a few, you know, maybe a few months ago, she's being interviewed, you know, at Washington Post. And I remember the guy asked her, well, well, what about your board? You know, you, I know you want to do this. And I, I fell in love with Elizabeth because she said, well, you know, I told them what I wanted to do if I took this job. And so if you didn't, you know, want me to do this, well, we could still be friends. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, if I take this job, get out of my way and I'm going to do what I want to do. And, and if I just looked at, um, monitor what she uh, had been funded, you know, she has an interest in poetry and, and she had made sure that, you know, poetry will go into the prisons, you know, um, she's funded poet laureate positions, you know, so that a person could be, you know, wanting to do work, well, they're going to get some money for doing the work that they love. And so she has a significant impact in terms of being, you know, at the Mellon Foundation. And you can see that her fingerprints are on the things that they are funding, sure. you know. And so I, I really applaud her. And this is one of the things I go back to Curly. If we look at what's lacking, okay, not only is in the people in these in foundation decision making, but black critics, mm -hmm. black music critics, black film critics, visual arts, that is very, very important. Who makes sense of this? You see, because what happened, we're at a time now where people don't want to pay attention to the critic. Why? Because we feel that if we post something and a lot of people like it, it must be good. Yeah. And if the critic comes along, he or she's just one voice. <laughs> okay, why should we listen to that person? Yeah, okay. not criticism. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> right, right, exactly. 
but, so, but I think uh, it's very important. <laughs> Yeah. And that, and I think this is a role where where universities have to play a role, museums yeah. have to play a role. I mean, this is what we're talking about. And and what happens, publishing companies, you know, have to make sure, okay, we're going to invest in this book. Or when we talk about funding universities, make sure that you fund special collections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because yeah. that's where the material is that a critic or a scholar can come along. And we also need, along with the critics, we need the biographers. Okay. Somebody needs to do a big book on David Driscoll. Okay, yeah. you know, I mean, that's, the, you know, I mean, if you look up, there are places where there are just no biography. Okay. That, at the Driscoll Center, we developed a series, and you might be aware of it also, is the Leg Living Legacy series. And part of that reason was because there was not a book that was telling David's story, personal story, not as a historian, but as an individual that that evolved over time. And the question I used to always ask him, why you, David? Why is it you, <laughs> this little kid from Eatonton? And I, that story, it was clear to me, that story was not gonna be written. It was not gonna happen. So we did it in a series of 10 uh, talks around the country. And that was the motive because that, no one was writing that story, writing that book. But you, to support your, your contention there is there needs to be a commitment to that and resources to do that. Well, let me, um, mindful of the time, and I can, and I know you all, of my wonderful panelists, you have so much to share, um, um, but what I'd like to do is just make sure we um, look at some of the wonderful questions that have been, that your commentary can is I just, generating. Can I interject one more thing, and that's the Augusta story, that in doing the film, the, the story that hit home, especially as a daughter of an artist, that she did not have the money to bring back the harp, which is this great piece. This is a miniature of it back from the 39 World's Fair. I just cannot wrap my mind around it that she didn't find the funds there. So, you know, we talk a lot about statues being removed or destroyed, and I understand that. And I think this is a movement that has a, a lot of a strong basis. But I think we should also talk about restoring statues. So I wrote an essay in the New York Times, Darren Walker, who has done a great job with the Ford Foundation, just as well as Ms. Alexander. And I'm hoping that the, he did a study and we're hoping that money will be raised. And my goal is that it would be in Queens where it originally was for the 39 World Fair, down in Florida where she grew up, I'm hoping the museum, the, uh, the African American Museum here, and he doesn't know it yet, but I'd love to see it at Obama's, uh, you know, presidential library in Chicago, and for that matter, get it all around the city and uh, the country. And I think that's also true that a lot of these artisans that were funded by Rosenwald, sometimes they they're at historical black colleges and they need to be restored or maybe need to be replicated in other places. And I mean, there's a great legacy there. And I think that's also re our responsibility because the work that came out of just the fun, what the fund supported has, has to not right. be lost to America. All right, well, very good, yes. And by the way, um, Aviva has a bonus feature on Augusta Savage that we'll be sending to all the participants tonight afterwards. Um, so thank you generously for making that available. Um, let's get to um, some questions. Um, we have, we have, and some comments here. Um, we have a, a question about Rosenwald's contribution to Tuskegee University. Um, and that, that the university doesn't mention Rosenwald on their website, is this simply short memory? Um, well, there's certainly a tribute to him right there at the school. I could not have made this film without their archives and so many members of their faculty helping me. And they also you know, gave me carte blanche to film there. I don't know about their current website, but I say, you know, just like I went to the Philadelphia National Jewish Museum and I toured it and guess what name or picture was not there. So as John Lewis said, see something, do something. I certainly said something to them and a year later in their annual dinner, 
uh, Senator Cory Booker talked only about Roosevelt and there's a picture. So I say, you know, write, write the Tuskegee website and say something. Well, you know, we can look at how websites are developed. You know, they give it to somebody who has no humanities background, <laughs> <They're> the <IT laughs> guy, you know, and then you get what you want. And then if, for example, nobody you know, has time to, to review it, you know, uh, it's going to be lost. And what you saw is sometimes a generational thing. And the person that might have that knowledge may not be, you know, tech savvy. So he or she may not look at that website. And then the other thing, just like what we're saying now, we can mention this, are they going to update it? Okay, many websites, you know, are outdated. Okay, and what happens now with historically black colleges and other institutions, they may not have the money to keep it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's that has a lot to do. But I know that that sometimes a website is put up with somebody, you know, who's into analytics. <laughs> you know, they, they're not into anything with any sort of history yeah. or philosophy. <laughs> Good point. Well, we, no, we, it, uh, we, we're, we've just launched a new website for the Phillips, so I'll just plug that there too. Um, <laughs> and what's their background? <laughs> um, but uh, let me ask this question that we got from Cheryl Edwards to address to Professor Holton. Um, does this type of philanthropy, I think she's referring to the Rosenwald Fund, exist for African-American artists, I think meeting today? If yes, what does that model look like? Well, I'm not sure it exists in the same way that you have a singular individual with such wealth that is committed to uh, the work of African-American artists. You have individuals who have made real impact uh, around the country and are known for doing this. And sometimes their gifts are really significant in, in contrast to their income, but they're so passionate about it that they, are tra they give transformative gifts. So there's individuals uh, on a smaller scale rather than a larger scale. But what is interesting phenomena that has occurred is very successful African-American artists like Kende Wiley and uh, Mark Bradford have established residency programs themselves for artists and they give out fellowships. So it's, a, you know, they've had a great deal of market success and they are now creating opportunities for artists. So they learn the model. Uh, so I think the model no longer exists in the same way, and it's more institutional now. You apply to the uh, Guggenheim, you apply to the Mellon, you apply to other kinds of institution, Ford uh, Institution Foundation, but not uh, big patrons, major patrons like this. I think Gates is the, they said that Rosenwald was the Gates, the, uh, the Gates of his time, and that uh, Gates is, with his wealth, is using it to transform and impact a science and, and the future in a different kind of way, not necessarily the arts, but they've been very, they've been compared to each other. So I think the shift has moved away from this major patronage from the arts to perhaps science and other kind of areas and technology, not so much culture. Okay, thank you. I think also the uh, MacArthur, even though you can't apply, they have to find you. Yes. And I also uh, wanna compliment the Phillips, especially under the leadership of, of Dorothy Kuczynski, that I think your exhibits, I mean, we're not only talking about critics and getting funding, but you know, what museums are, are exhibiting. And I think that's really important too. And in David's testimony that I read today, he said that he did meet, um, you know, Duncan Phillips, who had come to an art gallery that was showing African-American artists. So I don't think it just happened in terms of getting the Lawrence exhibit once he went up to New York. I think he saw the community here and visited it, it and, and became aware of it. All right, and I have an interesting question here um, for you, Aviva. Um, it says, uh, please expand on the idea of Jewish patronage toward Blacks. I'm told that because of the prevalence of white racism, bigotry towards Jews, their many efforts towards black patronage was a means toward assimilation, acceptability. Uh, okay. I don't know if I can answer it exactly the way it's phrased. I do know that uh, Julius Rosenwald was very influenced by Rabbi Emil Hirsch, who himself had been an immigrant who played football at the University of Pennsylvania, had come to Chicago, was an incredible orator. Actually, services were on Sunday because people were working on Saturday. And he would call out people who like ran a, 
a slaughter factory and was exploiting people to the point that they would get up and go out. And it was that kind of Judaism that he was listening to, to Kum Alom repairing the world. And actually when Booker T and Julius Rosenwald started developing the relationship, first Booker T, he had a luncheon for him in Chicago. Then he went down to Tuskegee. He took his rabbi with him. They had like a whole train together. So I think that um, it was a certain, and I, I must mention, it's very important that Emil Hirsch was one of the original signers to the call for action, the NAACP call. So I think he was very influenced by his rabbi. And I think it was very much, there's also another expression in Judaism, Sadaka, charity was important. And very early before Julius Rosenwald became super rich, he already much to <laughs> the surprise to his wife that he would save a third, give away a third and live on a third. And it was just the way he felt. And he had gotten that something about growing up in Springfield. And don't forget, he lived across the street from Abraham Lincoln. And it was, you know, after his time, you know, Lincoln was already dead, but he had sold, sold medallions for something, you know, that was uh, when they were establishing in Springfield a tribute to Lincoln. And it was all these kind of legacies and ideas he was exposed to. He was a good businessman, but I think he was a little embarrassed being so successful. And he thought that I have to do something with it. And, you know, this is Mackenzie Scott. Look how she's giving to all the historical black colleges. You know, she had probably the biggest divorce settlement ever, but she's saying, you know, I got to give, and even Bezos himself. I mean, I am I have this list of people I keep on wanting to send the DVD to because my the best thing I could do in making this film is to s inspire others to give. You know, you can't take it with you. Thank you know, you, when you Rita. say that, you know, I also look at, we have a generation of athletes who are taking that same approach, right. you know, in terms of funding things that they feel are very important. Um, many, like you could take, for example, of uh, LeBron James, you know, dealing with education, having a starting a school. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there are models there, you know, and I think that when we look at the enlightened athlete, you know, I, I, be, I, be, I look at people like Jackie Robbins, who, who had, you know, opened a bank after you know, baseball. I look at Magic Johnson, you know, I look at Deion Sanders, you know, some of these guys who were business people and they realized they could only play ball for so many years, but they realized that they wanted to do something uh, for their community. They just didn't want to, you know, gather wealth and, 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 and put it somewhere. But I really think that when I look at LeBron James, you know, getting involved in film on schools, you know, there's a model there. And, and I think these athletes, you know, who we saw coming to the forefront, especially with Black Lives Matter, it's a different type of athlete. And, and, and one could go back and look at the connection between athletes and filmmakers. And Aviva knows this, that when Spike Lee was trying to film, finish a Malcolm X film, I think it was Michael Jordan, people like them that gave money so that he could finish the film. And that's the type of thinking that we need as we move forward coming out, especially out of this pandemic. We're gonna to have to have people to take a leadership role. And I recommend seeing A Night in Miami, directed by, by a woman. By, yeah. And written by Kemp Powers. Right. <laughs> And, and that's a debate that's going on there. Malcolm is challenging, you know, a singer and Mahatma, Sam Cook, I mean, yeah. Keep in mind too, to go back to that earlier question that uh, uh, both Jews and blacks in many ways had a shared uh, dehumanizing experience. They were the, um, you know, those that were disenfranchised, the untouchables, ghettoized, uh, murdered, destroyed, uh, churches burned, synagogues uh, burned and destroyed. So there was this, uh, not necessarily shared totally, but a sensitivity to the, to the uh, common experience of being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. uh, although blacks could not you know, integrate as, as Jews could, Jews could become white. They could leave their right. sort of ethnic identity and go into the suburbs. But for a long time, uh, they had to share this space of being abused and, and disenfranchised, as I mentioned. So it builds a sensitivity. And I think that Jewish patronage, and I'm sure it's not just for uh, uh, Rosenwald for Blacks. I'm sure he supported Jewish organizations, yeah. uh, Jews coming from Europe, uh, you know, the war and, 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 and Europe, all of that, I'm sure 
uh, he was addressing some of those issues. But what became very popular, that's an expectation, what also became socially popular was the support of blacks during this period. George O'Keefe and Alfred Steglitz, you just go down the list of Carl Van Vechten. These were patrons that were supporting blacks, both literary and also individual arts. So it was the cause to celebrate during the 1920s to the 50s, perhaps. But let me say also something, that at the time Rosenwald was giving money in the South, the governor was calling him out with um, you know, anti-Jewish comments. Sure. Leo Frank, who was running a factory, he was from the North, but running in the teens, a factory in Atlanta, who had been unfairly charged with killing Mary Fagan. And it was Rosenwald and actually the Salzberger family who owned the New York Times raising money for his defense. The Klan came in and lynched him. Yeah. And that really scared the Jewish community in the South. You know, they're talking about this wonderful victories in Georgia just now where we have the black minister and the Jewish filmmaker right. running for Senate. And they're talking about it's back the old days, like, you know, mm -hmm. the civil rights era. And it just made my heart feel so warm because in fact, Rosenwald is, I think, you know, people often ask, why isn't he known more? And I think it's because it's a hundred years ago, out of Chicago, he was too modest and it's among Southern blacks. Yeah. But one thing the film has done is really, you know, I think hopefully change that because it's just not acceptable that, you know, there's just so many reasons why he should be known, but more importantly, those he supported. You know, that's interesting, Viva. Th th that story of those Blacks that remained in the South that didn't migrate has not been told very well. We don't know that story very well. Well, so you know, I it's another thing, too. There's also the, uh, the migration back and Charles oh, Blow, yes. the New York Times columnist, just talked the other morning. I am finding in some of the schools that I filmed uh, the participants in restoring it, Oftentimes it's people that have retired and went back to the land they still owned and had such warm memories about going to Rosenwald schools. I mean this, I invite you all to go on the website of the National Trust for Historical Preservation and find those schools that have been restored. They're like a stone's throw from Washington. And these restorations are wonderful. This earlier today, I did one of a group of people that are doing out of tide water and, you know, the repurposing of buildings. You know, I also have a master's in urban planning. I mean, those schools were green architecture before anyone was talking about. And, you know, it, it was Robert Taylor, the only black graduate, the first black graduate out of MIT. He's the one that developed it. And we can talk about architecture being a white male profession until we're blue in the face. But um, I think he also doesn't get enough credit for, and also Booker T and, and the kind of the bricks they developed there. I mean, it's just amazing to me, the kind of lessons that we can learn. And whenever you watch MSNBC, and I encourage you to watch it, and you see Eugene Robinson, he is a proud graduate of a South Carolina Rosenwald School. And of course the late great um, uh, uh, John Lewis. And, you know, he talks about, preaching to the chickens, and I think he did, and it's a funny story, but I know that it was a Rosenwald school that helped make him the man he is. And if you watch on Netflix now, George Wolf has directed a wonderful movie called Ma. Ma, Ma, Ma Rennie's Black Bottom. Yeah, with um, mm -hmm. Viola Davis, who kills it. And he went to a Rosenwald school, and he says some in the film, but it's even more in the, in the, on the DVD of the pride that his mother and his aunt were in teaching in the Rosenwald School. The, you know, this is self-determination before we were even talking about it. And I know that that happens somewhat in the Jewish community in our own schools. But in conclusion, because I get very excited about this, we cannot let those people, my grandparents died in Auschwitz. It was a very difficult day for me yesterday. But the ones who are carrying the Confederate flags are also wearing those t-shirts and we cannot let them succeed at all. And in making this new movie about imagining the Indians, my co-director Ben West is Cheyenne. The project was brought to me by who are now the producers, Kevin Blackstone and Sam Bradley. And we talk about our people all suffered from genocide. 
And this is why we're making it together. And we're gonna show people we can't do these things in our society anymore. It is unacceptable. And that's why I love how much the, the artists, so many of the artists that Rosamond supported did political themes. So Viva, obviously, yeah, there, you know, there, you're, there's so much impact and, and I know um, in all of your projects, you know, that there's, there's a call to action really in them. And I think that I hope that um, I'm sure our, our audience has been inspired. Um, and I know that um, uh, you wanted to share Aviva a thought that David Driscoll from your interview with him left you with when you prompted him towards the end of the interview. Right. Um, I asked everyone, the last question was, what would you say to, to Julius Rosenwald if you had met him? So this is what David said to me. I would thank him for being out there ahead of the crowd, for having a vision like the Hebrew poets. And this is what David quoted. Behold, I set the on the walls of Jerusalem, looking out to the people, seeing what is coming. And he was one of the prophets. And he was the one who put his money where his mouth was. I wish I had known him. And I have to say, so do I. And before we end, I just have to say, wear your mask and statehood for DC. <laughs> We're gonna turn to Ethelbert to, to share a poem and close this out. Thank you, Ethelbert. It's okay. Um, since we began dedicating this program to David Driscoll, I'll read my poem, Black Men Are Precious. Black men, black friends having strokes, black men younger than me, good men with bad hearts, men who did not follow their fathers into factories or the post office, black men who went off to college and pulled themselves up by degrees, men who did not sink into despair, but lifted their families into new homes, Black men who survived the bullets, streets, and police. Black men who saw the horizon and the stars. They marched as if Garvey held out his hand, not to Ethiopia, but to our hearts. Black hearts, now failing for unknown reasons. Why? Why do we die so young? Why are we not like our grandfathers sitting on the porch rocking away the years? Why are we not the black men returning from the wars and lifting our girlfriends up into wives again? Why do we date this early death? After all the exercise and pills, after the changing diet, why is there such a cruel hunger that appears and takes our years? Black men, my friends resting in their open coffins, waiting for someone to sing, precious Lord, and take their hand. Black hands closing with so much love still left to give. Bravo. Mm, it's beautiful. Thank you, God. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Thank you, all my wonderful panelists, and thank you for being a great audience. I know there were a few questions about um, how to uh, support other films of yours, Aviva. So I hope you'll um, we'll, we'll follow up um, on how to support the Augusta Savage uh, project. So we'll, we'll follow up on that um, when we send the Augusta Savage bonus feature. Right, they can go to church. And most of all, is the museum open? For those of you who have been here at the museum, go again and again. For those of you out of the city, next time you come. So what are the, is there, uh, hours available for we will be reopening um, when we um, can um, and sh share our inaugural centennial exhibition at the end of February so very shortly we're, we're gearing up as we speak and we will have our Jacob Lawrence of course migration series but many many other gems to to uh, to share in that exhibition so we do look forward to welcoming everyone back uh, in the space with time tickets um, at the Phillips. So thank you all so much, um, really, for joining us. Um, and, and really, I wish you, um, I wish everyone very well. And I hope we're um, all going to figure out a way to help repair the world for a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you. And buy a membership to the <laughs> Phillips to fill up for another great yeah. program. All right. And go visit the, the center, right?
Right. Yes, please. The Driscoll yeah. Center. Absolutely. Okay. Take care, Curly. Take care, Elsa. All right, Viva. Take care. Okay. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. How many days until spring training, Ethelbert? I'm joining the pitchers and catchers, so I'm leaving tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we got some new trades. That's right. what Ethelbert and I share. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.